I'm glad to be here, and I'm glad it's the spring. I always feel like I'm coming alive at this time of year. Driving out here tonight from Goleta, I passed by a vacant field with beautiful, beautiful wildflowers. I visited the same field last year during the spring, and it also had flowers. This year, however, there are different species of flowers. Ecological succession is underway. Pretty soon, that same field will evolve into the local, mature version of the ecosystem, a shopping mall. <laughs> Magical, isn't it? <laughs> From deserts to juicy couture, The miracle of nature at its finest, at its most glamorous. <laughs> anyway, let's dive right in. It is a Monday night, and I know some of you have a tight schedule, so I don't want you to miss Dancing with the Stars <laughs> or Dancing with the Paraplegics or whatever it is you watch. I don't know. I'm not into those sorts of things. A little about myself. I was born and raised here in Santa Barbara, and I graduated a few years ago from the same environmental horticulture program that Jerry Sordome founded. I began researching alternative crops for dry lands quite simply because I didn't think I would be here today. A couple years ago, I thought it was the end of Western civilization. <laughs> so I decided to use my horticulture. I wanted to know which plants I could plant to save my behind. And although I want to help fix some of the environmental disasters on this planet, I did not have enough frequent flyer points to go colonize Mars. So my first choice was no longer an option. In any case, I want to provide the average person with a botanical knowledge for growing more food with less water. Many books have been written on sustainable land use practices, yet there is still a lack of awareness of the myriad of edible plants native to water-scarce regions throughout the world. The world hosts a vast array of lost, edible, botanical gems. Current estimates are that there are about 330,000 species of plants in the world, of which about 20,000 to 30,000 are edible. Despite this fact, only three species make up 60% of the average human's caloric intake, and just 20 plants account for 90% of the average person's total diet. How water efficient are these common crop plants? Horribly. Most of these commonly consumed species are annual crops with very high water requirements. For example, on average, it takes 40 liters of water to produce a single slice of bread. And to make matters worse, such common thirsty crop plants are often indiscriminately planted in desert regions. As one egregious example, while people throughout the world go hungry, our governments continue to subsidize the planting of corn in drought-prone areas for the production of ethanol fuel, which is net energy inefficient. A lot of people like to ask what the difference is between botany and horticulture. But I feel it's more important to illustrate the difference between horticulture and agriculture. My most boiled down, simplified definition of horticulture is right plant, right place. And of course, a broader, more general definition 
of agriculture could be wrong plant, wrong place. <laughs> Most of the environmental problems relating to food production stem from one simple break from logic. Planting plants where they are not supposed to grow. It doesn't take years of academic study to know that the plants with high water requirements shouldn't be planted in the areas where there isn't water. Yet this is where modern agriculture continues to fail us. Currently, 70%, that's 7-0, seven 70% 70 of worldwide freshwater usage is irrigation. In many parts of the world, this water is pumped from dams and aquifers. And in places such as the Colorado River Delta, rivers now fail to discharge into the ocean. Yet aquifer depletion is perhaps a more alarming issue. Due to overpumping in China, the water table in many parts of that country is dropping at a rate of one meter per year. In North America, the Ogallala Aquifer is being drained at an average rate of 800 gallons per minute and has fallen from an average depth of 240 feet to a mere 80 feet deep. The United Nations own statistics state that 70% of the Earth's dry lands have been desertified, meaning that there has been a long-term loss of vegetation as well as a subsequent loss of soil in these areas. The UN defines dry lands as any region of the world with an aridity index of 0.65 or less. By this definition, dry lands account for 47% of the Earth's land surface. And now I'd like to switch gears and highlight a short passage from the foreword of my book, written by our local horticultural expert, Jerry Sordome. Earth is a rare and unique water world. The most curious of living creatures are being revealed to humankind as we discover our worldly perimeters. As we delve into almost every nook and cranny of Earth, extremophiles are revealing themselves. Yet as tenacious as life is, life's personality and character is distinctly fragile as it encounters its own boundary edges. This is the paradox, the tapestry of limits. I really like Jerry's notion of the tapestry of limits, so I wanted to highlight some of the most extreme plants on the face of the earth. These plants also happen to be edible. The first plant is known as the colocynth melon. The dried fruits of this plant can be seen blowing across the desolate landscape of the Sahara Desert before they crack open against rocks and disperse their seeds. Like most members of the melon family, the seeds of this melon can be roasted and eaten. The rest of the plant, including the fruit flesh, is poisonous. However, bioassays have revealed the presence of potent anti-cancer compounds. This next species is Boschia albitrunca. This small tree is native to southern Africa and produces edible roots and fruits. It became the world record holder for the deepest rooted plant when a specimen was found in the Kalahari Desert to have roots growing 223 feet deep. Boschia senegalensis is a North African relative now being used as an alternative crop for its edible fruits and for its seeds, which can be used as a cashew substitute after they have been leached with water. This palm species, Modemia argon, produces edible fruit and was thought to be completely extinct until just a few years ago when it was rediscovered in a remote region of the Nubian Desert. 
This perennial bunch grass is Panicum turgidum. The root exudates from this plant are a form of glue that traps sand particles and moisture. The seeds are processed as a grain crop in North Africa, and the plant can successfully complete its life cycle with just one inch of rain. Moringa peregrina, seen here, is a species native to the area around the Red Sea. The seed oil is a substitute for olive oil and has a greater resistance to rancidity. This is the Christthorn jujube, which is native to the Middle East and Northern Africa. The plant is a good phosphorus accumulator and produces edible fruits that are very similar to the temperate jujube. Earlier, I gave some information about drought, desertification, and water scarcity, and all those other dismal and horribly depressing statistics. So now we should all be asking ourselves, how can we restore dry lands? Of course, the plants I've just highlighted can be helpful in doing this. What I propose is to implement regenerative agroforestry, creating human-oriented artificial ecosystems in order to re-green vast expanses of desertified land. So how do we know it works? As an example, the Amazon rainforest creates about 50% of its own rainfall. Likewise, large-scale reforestation projects help rehumidify the atmosphere and provide condensation nuclei, which increases rainfall. My vision of artificial ecosystems uses mainstream ecological restoration as its design model. In ecological restoration, the goal is to replicate a healthy version of an ecosystem using 100% native plants. Artificial ecosystems, on the other hand, can use plants from similar climates around the world. To create an artificial ecosystem, we must first assess the native plants and the niches those plants occupy within the ecosystem, such as canopy, understory, ground cover, climbing vine, etc. In the Sonoran Desert, we often find saguaro cacti establishing themselves under the canopy of Olnia tesota, a.k.a. ironwood trees. From this association, we can derive a basic understanding that this climate supports small, nitrogen-fixing trees with cacti in their understory. Then, we can look to similar climates around the world for edible cacti and edible nitrogen-fixing tree species to occupy these same niches. What I'm proposing can be implemented on areas of land that have already been degraded. There is no need to replace virgin ecosystem with regenerative agroforests. That would defeat the purpose. Furthermore, if we must adapt to the realities of climate change, then we should not expect our native plants to perform optimally. If these plants are adapted to how the climate used to be, then we risk witnessing ecosystem collapse as the climate changes. Therefore, it behooves us to test plants from other regions. What I propose are food production systems that are largely self-managing and dependent on the natural rainfall patterns of the area, thus giving rivers and aquifers a rest, regenerating depleted soils, and restoring balance to the hydrologic cycle. Now let's look at some real-world examples. The Sahel is a strip of land bordering the southern end of the Sahara Desert. It is a very brittle environment where desertification is a major issue, 
due to the fact that deforestation allows the Sahara to extend further south than it normally would. In many cases, reforestation projects entail planting plants in extremely sandy and dry places. Going from a barren desert to a productive savanna requires precision planting of key pioneer species. Panicum turgidum, a native perennial bunch grass, is most often planted as the first plant in order to stabilize areas of shifting sand, which it is able to accomplish with its glue-like root exudates. Panicum turgidum is able to grow in areas with as little as one inch of annual rainfall. The centers of Panicum turgidum bunches are often hollowed out and extremely deep-rooted, useful tree species are planted. This provides the tree saplings with a relatively humid, wind-protected microclimate so that they can more easily establish themselves. Other edible species that may be suitable as dune-fixing pioneers are the moat bean, Vigna aconitifolia, and the marama bean, Tylosema esculentum. Moat bean plants are native to the sandy tar desert of western India and eastern Pakistan and can successfully complete their life cycle with just two inches of rain. Moat bean is an annual spreading ground cover with an edible bean and a fodder value rivaling that of alfalfa. Marama bean is a perennial ground cover native to the Namib and Kalahari deserts in southern Africa. It too produces an edible bean. Such ground covers help trap humidity in the soil and prevent wind erosion, two essential elements for establishing larger plants. So how is the food quality of these plants? When I was on a local plant safari with my friend, I introduced him to Chilean wine palm fruits for the first time. After tasting one, his response was, well, it's certainly not as good as a burrito. <laughs> and yes, I myself was disappointed to find there isn't a pizza tree. <laughs> but I did learn how goats are made. You can see there's some ripe ones on this specimen here. <laughs> this next species is known as Munius maximus. <laughs> this species is native to New York City. It could be helpful for struggling farmers. As far as I know, the most research developing new crops from dry regions has come out of the Negev Desert of Israel. The cover of my book is the result of one study conducted with the apple cactus, Sirius repandus. This species of cactus is native to northern Venezuela and the Netherlands Antilles, yet the Israelis decided to take it outside of its natural habitat and develop it as a novel crop. Nowadays, these fruits serve an export market to Europe. And although not all the experiments in the Negev Desert were a success, they nonetheless give us valuable insights into the adaptability of many novel dry land crops, such as marula, which can produce up to four and a half tons of fruit from one tree in a single year. And finally, turning to our area, I'd like to introduce a few plants worthy of cultivation. The first, Lardi Sabala bitternata, is a highly shade tolerant evergreen vine native to central Chile. The plant produces edible fruits similar to passion fruits that are popular in Chilean markets. This species might find a niche in the understory 
of the future Carib woodlands of California. Another plant is Santalum acuminatum, a semi-parasitic small tree native to Australia. The fruit is edible and so is the seed kernel. The seed kernels are high in protein and contain up to 60% fat. Because of their high oil content, seed kernels are actually flammable and can be burnt like a candle nut. This next plant will put the lemon industry out of business. <laughs> With the scientific name Coriocactus brevistylus, this unique cactus is native to high altitudes of the Andes in southern Peru and northern Chile. There, its softball-sized fruits are harvested and used as lemon substitutes. It has the advantage of being more cold tolerant than lemon trees by about 10 degrees Fahrenheit, and it naturally uses just a fraction of the water that lemons require. As we head into the future, we must be innovative in the face of the myriad of environmental crises we face. Yet, more importantly, we must act with enthusiasm to bring about the changes we wish to see in the world. As we rediscover the lost, edible gems from the waterless corners of the world, I hope to add one more piece towards solving the puzzle of a sustainable future. <laughs>